This one out to you, we're on track to do 170 million, 111 stores strong, 550 staff. It's a beast of a business, nutrition warehouse. When I was about 21 years old, my dad passed away. Presented to the doctors, the doctor sent him straight to emergency, and 48 hours he'd passed away. And he was 42 years old. And that was a bit of a catalyst for me. Lived my dream of bodybuilding, but then obviously at the end of it, after 10 years, was like, so what do I do? Maybe I can open up a supplement store. <laughs> Former Mr. World, except they have one big problem. And that money. Yeah. Like you might be friends and you join a business and think it's going to be just as good. And you know, once dollars get involved, then things can change. From competing in bodybuilding to then competing against other supplement stores. A lot of people were like, you're crazy. ASM like owns the industry. Which one of those were the most important to you that you think brought the success of Nutrition Warehouse? What really drove Nutrition Warehouse was what is up guys welcome to this extraordinary edition of unemployable in the podcast today we have grant mayo the founder of one of australia's most successful retail chains nutrition warehouse there is over 110 stores around the country turnover this year of around 170 million dollars and 550 employees this is the story of a man from newcastle in australia who built this brick by brick with his own hands and his awesome team that he built these are all company-owned stores not franchised if you stick around right to the end of this pod you are going to hear exactly how grant built this business starting with one store in underwood brisbane adding a second store a third store a fourth store we go in into the journey of that growth we go into the challenges of that growth how he built culture how he drives performance in the business and everything in between this is a podcast that you do not want to miss listen all the way to the end as we hear grant riff on his story with eric who's also built a nine-figure e-commerce business it is an absolute ripper stay tuned what is up everybody welcome back to another edition of unemployable podcast welcome to the show we have an absolute ripper for you today we have one of australia's best known brands in the health and fitness category and with the founder and i guess the ceo with us today grant mayo grant how are you welcome to the pod well it's great to be here today guys thanks for having me at the unemployable podcast <laughs> <laughs> you got to be one of the most unassuming dudes that we've had in here in a while. Why don't you just tell us up front, just give us the headline numbers on this beast of a business, Nutrition Warehouse. Yeah, no problems at all. Yeah, um, this one out year, we're on track to do 170 million. Wow. Uh, we're 111 stores strong and uh, 550 amazing staff. That's absolutely incredible. And um, you started that from scratch, you built it you know, brick by brick, I can't wait to get into that story and, and hear all about it. Marky Marks, how are you, buddy? Mate, I'm excited. Today's going to be a ripper podcast. Can't wait to get into this story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Eric, how you doing, mate? What's going on? I'm very good. I'm very good. Glad to have Grant here. We've known each other for quite some time. I wasn't sure if he'd say yes to coming on the pod, and he did. And here we are. How good? I, I think it's pretty cool. You know, here we are. I just want to, you know, just take a moment to acknowledge the gold coast like here we are on the gold coast we've got two legitimate ecom um titans here really i mean i'm not to pump your tires up too much but two guys here with nine figure businesses sitting at our humble little desk in southport um you know shout out to the gold coast for the level of entrepreneurship that is now coming to this state you know queensland's always been sort of like the uh, backwater so to speak but it's changing and there are more and more entrepreneurs like you with a 100 million dollar company grant with on your way to a 200 million dollar company and mark and i bring it up the, the oh. place somewhere well <laughs> below that i'm sitting here going shit i gotta lift my game <laughs> and, uh, you know proximity proximity is power so i'm happy to be here and uh, hopefully some of this can rub off here it's gonna be awesome now before we get into the podcast uh, as always, guys, if you are enjoying this podcast, please like and subscribe. The subscribe is really important to us. And uh, particularly if you're on YouTube, so we can get some feedback on, on how this stuff is landing, uh, drop a comment in as well, because uh, we read those comments. It encourages our guests and, and makes them feel good about coming on the show. Grant certainly doesn't have to be here. He's here because he knows his story will inspire and 
uh, probably a younger version of Grant would have been super inspired to hear this story himself, which we're going to unpack. So drop a comment, drop a like, and a subscribe so we can get more people like Grant on the show. And as always, we want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Early Bird AI. Uh, Early Bird is uh, helping small businesses uh, and medium businesses as well all around the country to implement AI into their business. For a lot of people, we know that AI is a once in a generation mega trend along the same lines as the internet and along the line, same lines as mobile phones. Uh, this is one of those things that happens once, uh, you know, every blue moon where businesses have a real opportunity to change their market share by leveraging technology. If you're in that category and you have any kind of business, um, uh, that is doing any kind of revenue, make sure you go to earlybird.ai and book yourself a free audit. The two guys that own the company, Eric and I, are the investors in the business. We funded them to get them going, but they've been absolutely smashed by businesses around the country that know they should have AI in their business. They haven't done it yet. Get a free audit. The boys will be on the phone with you for 30 minutes for free. Do a deep dive in your business. Come back with a proposal showing you the exact tools that they can implement for you, and then I'll hand it back over to you fully installed and your business running a lot smarter more profitably and more leverage so early bird so it's e-a-r-l-i rather than y bird dot a-i go check it out so with that said we are going to jump right into this pod um, we can't wait to unpack this this is one of queensland's uh, best uh, retail stories we think um, so grant tell us the origin story of nutrition warehouse how did you get into the business of selling supplements to uh I, I suppose aussies and maybe new, new zealanders as well yeah great question um well it started many years ago realistically the reason i'm here today is because of bodybuilding realistically uh, i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys <laughs> um so when i was about 21 years old uh there was a bit of a life event happened in my life my dad passed away um he had um cardiac I can't even pronounce the word, but amylosis, which is a hardening of the um, calcium around the heart. Mm. So he presented to the doctors. Um, doctor sent him straight to emergency, and 48 hours he'd passed away, uh, and he was 42 years old. Wow. And that was a bit of a catalyst for me, and, a, and uh, two things happened. Obviously, I lost my dad, which is terrible, at, especially at 21 years old. But also, it was a bit of a gift from my dad. He, he basically made me think, about myself and about my health and fitness. Uh, so I went and joined the gym. And, uh, you know, at 21 years old, I grabbed a couple of mates. We went to the local gym in, uh, in Newcastle. It's when I'm born and bred. And um, I just wanted to get a little bit healthy and a bit fitter. I was short, skinny, and I thought, I need some meat on these bones. So I uh, started pumping some iron, and a couple of those mates sort of drifted away, and I kept going. I really liked the the process, my body was changing, going to the gym every day, eating healthier foods. And then I saw this bodybuilding magazine of, you know, Arnold and all those legends in the day. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then one day I was there and Lee Priest was there. I'm not sure if everyone knows Lee Priest, yep. but he's probably, a, well, he would be Australia's best ever bodybuilder. Uh, short in stature, five foot four, but uh, he was only young around younger than I was at 19, and he was just an unbelievable physique. And from that day on, I went, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a bodybuilder. Yeah. So I set out my sights on my first comp and uh, down in Wollongong with my girlfriend at the time and sort of snuck away from my family and friends because I was like, shit, am I going to do any good at this? Mm -hmm. And uh, after two years of training, I jumped on stage and won the novice comp down in Wollongong. And I went, wow, okay, that's pretty cool. I, am I under something here? Can I actually go further, what else can I do? So I kept pushing myself and looked at another comp, set another goal, and went after that, and I won that as well. So then I set my sights higher, and I went, well, okay, I want to be the best Austra Australian bodybuilder, besides Lee Priest, uh, the best I can be, the best top amateur, because Lee was a professional bodybuilder then. Uh, and I set my sights on that, and um, went after comp after comp, and I finally won the Mr. Australia in 1995, only about three years after I started training. Wow. And then I headed up winning, next year I went again, and I won the Mr. Australia again, and then they gave me a ticket to Greece. Um, never been on a plane before, I was 26 years old. They said, here's plane ticket to Greece, you're going to the world titles. 
his accommodation. I was like, shit, I don't even have a passport. Um, now, I guess when we go back, you know, back to 1997, that was, that, you know, like travel and gyms weren't what they like today. There wasn't big box gyms and there wasn't that many. Uh, so I was pretty ecstatic and jumped on that plane and went to the world titles in Greece thinking, man, if I can just get top 10, top six, I'll be ecstatic, you know. Um, and then I still remember being on stage and they called out the top six and I was in the top six and then they called it the top five and then four and then three. And I'm like, did they forget I'm up here or what? <laughs> uh, and then they called out the second place winner and announced me as first place wow. winner of Mr. World in 1997 in Greece. Have we, let's put up a photo of around that time, Greg, online. Um, and uh, we were looking at this before. <laughs> Look at the body, like just absolutely insane physique unbelievable right. yeah it reminds oh, me yeah. a, a bit of what i'd like I to look like <laughs> <laughs> you're very tanned <laughs> hey? well, yeah. well, natural tan <laughs> <laughs> very gold coast mate very gold coast yeah. <laughs> but i gotta say something else we said to you off camera asked how old you are today and how old are you today just for the record 55 yeah so obviously that's paid off you uh, incredible right that's inspiring you look great for thank you appreciate that. absolutely amazing pump your iron kids yeah I think, I think it comes from my genetics if you see my mum at 55 she was incredibly good-looking woman too. Was well, she? Yeah, just no, like me. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't say good-looking. We just said like body-wise. I think. <laughs> Oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Eric. It hurt my heart. Way to build rapport there, buddy. I love it. Um, no, no, that's fantastic. So you got into bodybuilding. You did incredibly well. And where was the jump? Like, where in that journey? Because, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the, the crossover between the discipline that that takes and the discipline that business takes. That's sort of an easy get, which we'll get to. But at what point did you, you think... Because I assume you had a job at that time, or what were you doing that time professionally, and what what made you think I'm going to make the leap into the supplements business? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that was 1997, and I kept competing up until uh, 2000. So I'd done the Mr. Universe in '98, uh, had shoulder reconstruction, and then in 2000, I'd done the world title again, which was in New Zealand. Uh, I come third in that one, and I thought, well, I'm going backwards. Maybe it's time to bow out. <laughs> Um, and it's funny, something happens after you win something like a world title that you sort of never thought was possible or could achieve. But once you've achieved it, that is the, the golden goose, you know, so to speak. And I sort of actually did enjoy my training as much after that because I already felt like I achieved the pinnacle of what I wanted to. I overachieved. I just wanted to win Mr. Australia and won Mr. World. Um, so in 2000, I sort of went, what am I going to do? You know what I mean? So um, I had a phone call from a friend of mine, um, Ari, who owns Empire Fitness Center on the Gold Coast, and said, why don't you come to the Gold Coast and um, become a personal trainer, like yeah. everyone else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't a personal trainer, and I said, well, you know, I got my certificate, and I went up and personal trained on the Gold Coast. You're right, at Empire. At Empire. Up, at, up near Harbortown. Yeah, it's still there today. I used today. to work out there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great gym. Yeah. So you, you, so you became a PT at Empire Fitness. So you, that now you're professionally, I guess, in the, in the industry, not just lifting weights. You're actually working there as well. And so how, how did you start into the supplements business from there? Yep. So I found out very quickly that being a PT wasn't something I wanted to do. Right. Loved helping people and aspiring to reach their goals. However... Me being in the gym a couple of hours a day and then being in the gym six hours a day was like, okay, this is too much. Yeah. I don't want to see the gym that much. Um, so I started looking for another role and I got a role at a company called Southern Blue. And Southern Blue was a, a startup company of sports supplements. And my role was the sales manager. So they hired me, probably not because of my credentials, more of how I looked. Mm -hmm. Grant, go to every health food store, supplement store you can find, get our products in it. I'm like, okay, this sounds cool. Get in the car, go traveling around, find out what the stores are. And quickly I realized there was a lot of health food stores back then, like lots of Govitas and et cetera. But there wasn't many supplement stores. Mm. So there was a supplement den um, in North Brisbane and, uh, sorry, South Brisbane and North Brisbane was Ada Street. And there was people traveling all the way to Ada Street from the Gold Coast, friends, to spend $500 on supplements and come all the way back. And I, that's when I had that epiphany moment. I went, 
maybe I can open up a supplement store. <laughs> you know, like former Mr. World. People come into the store, I can advise them on how to train, how to eat, what supplements to take. That could work. Yeah. Except they had one big problem. I had no money. Yeah. Yeah. So I had this idea that possibility that could create something. Uh, at first, a job for myself, uh, but I had no cash. So, so wh- just give us perspective around that. What would it cost back then to open a supplement store? And that's the big question that holds so many young entrepreneurs back. People listening to this in Newcastle right now, they're on a wage. They've got just enough to pay their bills each week. How did you overcome the hurdle and how much cash did you need to open your first store? Like, tell us that story. Yeah. Well, I took a guess of how much I needed to open it, you know, calculated guess of $20,000, mm-hmm. which was like a million dollars to me. And back then too, right? You're talking 30 years ago? Yeah, I'm talking, uh, two th- uh, well, 2001. We're in 2001 20, 24 now. years ago. Yeah. So, you know, 10, 20, 30 grand was a lot of money to me. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I was a broke bodybuilder, realistically, you know, lived my dream of bodybuilding. But then obviously at the end of it, after 10 years, it was like, I got no money. Yeah. So what do I do? So I think two things happened actually. One, I had the idea, and at the same time, a good friend of mine handed me the book "Rich Dad Poor Dad." <laughs> it's probably the first book I ever actually read that wasn't bodybuilding or fitness focused. And after that book, I was like, "Yep, yeah, this is seriously what I have to do." Now, how do I do it? So obviously, I went to family to try and get the twenty thousand. Mum and dad are like, "No." Oh, sorry, mum's like, "No." Um, Friends, friends, no. And then I had a friend of mine, uh, Simon, who was always seen to be cashed up and fairly wealthy. And I went, Simon, come to the Gold Coast. Let's go and party because that's what you've done on the Gold Coast. There are a few cashed up bodybuilders on the Gold Coast, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are these days. There definitely are a few. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get, they sell we, supplements we, too. <laughs> 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 and I pitched the idea to Simon. Um, and he loved it. And he said, this is a great idea. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'll loan you the 20 grand, but let's go halves in it. Yeah. And I went, sure, I had nothing to lose. It was either do that or, don't, or I don't have the cash. So yeah, Simon and I went into partnership and uh, together we founded ASN or Australian Sports Nutrition in 2002. Opened our first store on the Gold Coast with $20,000. The first store was very rough. I laid the carpet myself, put up the shelving myself. I had a you know, second-hand counter in the corner, a cash drawer, wow. no computer. I didn't know how to turn on the computer. I didn't know how to start a business, how to do anything. I just, just like bodybuilding, I read the magazines. I spoke to as many people as I could. You know, what do you do and what's your training split? Same with us. Have you, have you got a photo of that store back then, like the first early ones? There is, yes. If, if you've got one, could you send it to us? Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to yeah. throw it into the YouTube clip because it's so awesome mm. seeing where people start and then maybe get a photo as well of today, like the ASN, sorry, the uh, Nutrition Warehouse facility today would be great to throw up side by side. For yeah, people. absolutely. So yeah. inspiring. So I guess it was just like making myself a job in, in, initially. Mm. But uh, how'd it go? Like what happened? Day one, you open, you've got you know, stuff on the shelf. Like yep. what, what happened when you first launched the business? Did it boom right away? Did, how did people find out about you? What happened? No one come in. No one, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't think that far. Right? It's just like, no. let's open the doors. <clears throat> there was stage no Google one. ads. No, no Google, Google ads, ads in Facebook. <clears throat> yeah, stage one, just open the doors. Mm. Uh, and then it was like, okay, well, how do we get people in? And then obviously start going, well, I know nothing about marketing or attracting customers or customer service. So what do I do? So, well... What's the easiest and cheapest way? I just started going to gyms and doing taste testing and going, hey, we're, we're down here at Southport, we've opened, we're ASN, you know, come down and buy some subs. And ASN went on, like it's still there today, it's yes. nowhere near as big as Nutrition Warehouse, but so that went on to grow as well. Um, so what was the journey there? Like what happened there? Yep, so, um, you know, ASN was about a five-year journey where mm-hmm. Simon and I built the company to five stores and on a really successful e-com online business. Mm. And we're talking early 2000s. So, you know, we saw what bodybuilding.com was doing in the States online, uh, you know, looking at um, places like GNC in the States who have like six, 7,000 stores and modeling some of the things they were doing. Um, so yeah, we expanded to five stores. And until that time, Simon was a, a silent partner, realistically. Uh, we, we would have obviously 
one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, once a week on, on the phone, chatting about strategy and what we want to do, and then I would execute that with the team. And then it comes to a point where Simon come into the business, and although we were friends, we probably weren't great business partners. Yeah. And the reason why is because Simon had different values and a different uh, vision than I did for the, for the business. Mm. You know, I, uh, I had a vision of, you know, big box retail, big stores, the big brands, warehouse prices, supplements for everybody, not just the athlete. Where Simon was more geared towards bodybuilding, athletes, small stalls, mm. specific supplements that cater for the athlete. How big is the biggest store that you have now, just in terms of size and uh, Look, you know, we have 111 stores, so they range in different sizes, and sometimes we take a store based on location over size. Um, our average store is probably around 200 squares. Okay. So, so you're up to five stores with ASN. I remember ASN because it was kind of localised on the Gold Coast, was it? Like, yeah, so it started in Southport. Yeah. Uh, second store was in Mermaid. The one near the courthouse, there was an ASN. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Just what down we, from there. What were you doing near the courthouse? I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> so I used, to, I used to go there because my partner at that time was a, a, a fitness co competitor and so she used to go in there all the time. Um, but yeah, so, so it was sort of a localised Queensland business. You had this divergence of visions. How did, it, how did that unfold with the separation? Because I know there's lots of people listening to this who are entrepreneurs that have come to a similar realisation, their business partner leaves or has another vision or there's a breakup or whatever. Was it just a discussion? You said, look, I'm going to go my own way and then you started your own thing. That must have been a difficult transition. Yeah, it was. Um, and look, you know, um, it's something that unfortunately wasn't probably a, a, a friendly handshake and say, let's go our own ways. Mm -hmm. um, and look, and business, business and friendships can do that, unfortunately. Like you might be friends and you join a business and think it's gonna be just as good and amazing, but you know, once dollars, cents, you know, workload, ethics, get involved, values, vision, then things can change. And they certainly changed with Simon and I, and unfortunately we left in bad terms. Um, and for about 10 years, we've, we were aggressive rivals for each other. It's only been probably the last five years that we've rekindled our, our friendship and our relationship and have coffee and shake hands and think, yes, it was ego driving us back then. Uh, so all things come full circle. Was, was that like, in looking back, you know, Patrick Bet David released a book called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. He talks about the positive impact of having a rival. Was there definitely some positive fuel there ah, for you? 1,000%. Yeah. What really drove Nutrition Warehouse in that first instance, you know, and our mission at the time was to, you know, our mission's changed now, but was to, to, to help others achieve their own individual health and fitness goals. Mm. Now it's built for life, mm. for consumers to be built for life. Um, but realistically, internally, it was crush ASN. Yeah. <laughs> I like that you're honest about that. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. Ego drove me for the first three or four years. It's actually, it's, it's actually something that doesn't get talked about a lot, mm. but having enemies that fire you up, even though you're on good terms with Simon, and that's great. But in truth, I mean, I know there's people in my life that, are, that I'm like secretly, I'm like, you know, fuck that guy, I'm going to. I'm going to smash that. You know what I mean? It's healthy, right? Like yeah, yeah, in, in yeah. a way. It's without being negative of about course, it. yeah. Competition I, breeds excellence. I said ego there, but it's probably not ego. It's probably more revenge, actually, is the word yeah. I'm looking for. I just like... Because... And there was uh, a couple of reasons for that, a couple of catalysts to that. It wasn't just because I wanted to destroy ASN, although I did. It was... I wanted to make sure that I was capable of starting a business and making it successful mm. on my own terms and not with some a partner or somebody else. So I had to, I guess, a bit like bodybuilding, get up on stage and compete with the best and make sure that I could win and walk away now and go, hey, I was, I was good. I wasn't as good as Lee Priest, but I, I was fulfilled and satisfied with my bodybuilding journey. I didn't leave any stone unturned. Tick, so I don't have to, no regrets right now. I guess the same with the business. When I started Nutrition Warehouse, I wanted to do that too. Did people say that at the time? Like, you won't make it on your own, Grant. You, you know, you like because at the time, ASN would have been quite big. Like, probably the biggest in Southeast Queensland. I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, a lot of people said that. A lot and, of people. A yeah. lot of people were like, "You're crazy." ASN like owns the industry, and they did. Like at that time, you go to any gym in Australia, 
bodybuilding comps, you know, in the industry, ASN I was remember. They were everywhere. everywhere. Did they have the protein shakers, ASN branded protein yeah. shakers? Yeah, yeah. I remember having one of those and I was in Melbourne. So yeah. They, they were, they were everywhere. Purple. I remember. That's it. Yeah, the purple little person. So what, what, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what made you think what, at, at that time, what made you think that you could, you know, separate yourself from that business and actually compete with them other than this kind of, you know, revenge, you know, you yeah. gotta have well, guts I, to actually think. I didn't I'm gonna, know, but I couldn't stay where I was. Yeah, no choice. You so felt like you had no choice. I, I had no choice. I had to had to get out for, for my own mental health. You know, like when you're going to, to uh, you know, to work or in a relationship and you're butting heads and it's not working, there's only so much a human can take. And I just knew if I looked further down the path that I, I can't, I cannot be part of that business. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that basically was the catalyst. So did I know I could make it work? No. But I knew from my bodybuilding days that I had the determination, the resilience uh, to, you know, eat all those meals, train every day, diet like a crazy person. Uh, and I think there's a difference between um, um, passion and, um, for a better word, I did write this word down. Discipline or? I did write this word down, excuse me, because it is important I wanted to get across, but I probably didn't write it down. Uh, no, That's right, no rush. Um, yeah, passion and obsession. Obsession. Sorry, that's yes. what I was looking for, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't passionate about bodybuilding. I was obsessed with bodybuilding mm. um, to the point where for that 10 years, you could talk to me about anything, I'd turn that back into bodybuilding somehow. Oh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I knew with that trait that they had that, you know, you could shit me a hundred times, I'll get back up yeah. that attitude that I would make it work. So crank, at that crank. time, at that time, uh, when you separated from the business, how were you financially? Like in regards to like, was there any money that you got out of the deal to help you get started? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So obviously we sold the business and I will sold 50% of my shares yes. and, okay. um, I walked away with enough cash to yep. start nutrition. So did you sell to Simon? Yes. Yeah. So correct. you sold out to him. Yes. It's it's just interesting to note though that it's so amazing that you did succeed because it doesn't always happen. I, I um, a relative of mine started JB Hi-Fi, and before the company went public, he's like, "No, I'm selling out." And then the pub the company went public, and JB Hi-Fi became what it was. And he took his proceeds from the sellout and tried to start um, Hi-Fi Supermarket. But he, but he wasn't able to rekindle the flame. So yeah. it, it is, you know, coming from behind, it is, is it pretty? Yeah, it was, it, pretty, was, a, it was a gamble without yeah. a doubt. And a lot of people were, were like, oh, you know, ASN's the best, like they're big, what would you leave How for? How many stores was it when you left? Five. Oh, so five stores. Yeah. So at that time though, it was big, right? I remember it felt like it was everywhere. Yeah, because five stores back, you know, in 2007. Before the franchise boom. Was the biggest in Australia. These, like, these no, one, no one had like, uh, double digit stores or single digit stores I just normally have one store yeah so the 117 stores you have now they're not franchised no company owned. they're company owned all you which is amazing yeah. uh amazing because it's the franchise model has been so popular yeah. so you, it's all company owned which is absolutely phenomenal uh story you know grant cardone says that he says be obsessed or be average and i think that is a real distinction in business like even with everything Eric does and I do and, and you do in our business like this podcast it's been an obsession that has got it you know every week there's something being improved and being you know getting better the standards are super high from the get-go but that's just I think the price of entry to anything that you want to dominate in mm. you know um, like imagine being at that point you know like you're part of a business the biggest supplement business basically on the Gold Coast or Southeast Queensland <clears throat> and all you have left is a bit of cash Discipline, obsession, and just this sheer revenge, yeah. you know, to get started. So which, out of discipline, obsession, and revenge, which one of those were the most important to you that you think brought the success of Nutrition Warehouse? Um, I think it was a combination. I, I don't think you can separate one from the other, um, but I'd probably go with discipline. Mm. I think discipline is the key for me to, uh, you know, Whatever I'm doing, you have to be disciplined in doing it, whether it was bodybuilding, nutrition warehouse. Um, I, I like to, I guess, discipline myself even today. 
you know, I still go to the gym. I, I've started having cold showers in the morning, those things. And, you know, my wife's like, what do you have these cold showers for? You're crazy. I went, I don't really want to have them all the time when it's cold, but it actually helps me be disciplined for that more, for, you know, for that, that start of the day. Um, it's not so to get much, comfortable with it, right? So much science behind that, behind doing hard yeah. things and things that you don't want to do and the benefits. Goggins and Huberman just did a pod yeah. on yeah. specifically doing hard things and the benefits of doing hard things. So, I mean, I want to dive into this, the growth story of Nutrition Warehouse because um, that is exceptional to get in this country. Is it all Australia or is some in New Zealand too? Uh, we're opening in New Zealand in July this year. Okay, but it's all Australia otherwise. All Australia. So I guess from Perth to far north Queensland, are you talking? Yeah, we're, yeah we're every, every state we're national. So National, yeah. Tassie as well. Good old Tassie. Tassie. Yeah, good. So 111 stores. How long has that journey been from start? 16 to, years. 16 years of doing the same thing and expanding. Um, so so t- let's, let's talk through that journey because... So many times, Gary V says this a lot, you know, don't compare my third quarter with your first quarter. Um, take us back to the beginning. Like, let's talk about the first couple of years. You opened one store. Yep. Where were you at the end of, say, two years into that journey? Yeah, so we opened the first store in uh, Underwood in Brisbane. Yep. And I had a 50K exclusion zone from ASM when I sold. They wanted Australia. I said 50Ks. I had the leverage. They said Yes. So 50 Ks, I was living in uh, Southport at the time. So I drove 50 Ks, I still remember, and going, and I landed at Underwood. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like. There's a bit of revenge. I'm gonna go right to the border, <laughs> motherfucker. 50.5 kilometers. <laughs> yes, bam. And, yeah, and I'm like. The revenge played a bigger part of this I at least. I love that. And there was two reasons for that. One, I didn't want to drive any further. I was like, <laughs> okay. Underwood's like a four, about a 15 minute commute. Okay. Um, and I didn't want to go any further. And it looked like a good area. There was one challenge with it, but besides everyone saying you're crazy leaving ASN, was that it was next to the supplement den. Now, I've said before that supplement den was one of the top two players in Brisbane. And we're doing extremely well. And we had a really good um, community and culture about their store. However... I opened across the road from them. That is amazing. <laughs> you, that, well, that, and was the thinking there, they've already got the customers coming, maybe I'll drag them across? No, it's it was 50 Ks. <laughs> <laughs> You're selling, that, but I don't think we're buying. That's grand. that competitive uh, spirit coming back again. I rem- remember in the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, he would make up wars against players that didn't even exist. It seems like from competing in bodybuilding to then competing against other supplement stores, that's all part of the way you get fired up. It is, it motivates me, drives me and things well. If they can do well, and yes, part of it would be, well, not every customer going to supplement den is going to be happy. Yeah. I'll take those customers to start with and then I'll build from there. You're a savage. And <laughs> <laughs> so you started with Underwood. Now, Underwood um, is, uh, is not, like, these are not, like, primo Luke's areas, right? Like, they're, they're like, working class suburbs. Yes. I was from Browns Plains. I know Underwood well. So you're in a working class area with real people. Uh, what happened from Underwood? So you opened in Underwood. How did it go once you got going? And then what was the journey in the first couple of years? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I opened uh, Underwood, um, you know, first few weeks. No one come in. Had to go do the guerrilla marketing, turn up at gyms, drop DL flyers, whatever I could. Um, and then I remember the grand opening we did, which was probably about four to five weeks after I opened. I'd done a soft opening, get it right. And... Uh, and then we'd done about $7,000 on that day, which back then in 2008, uh, which was the first store, found April 2008, uh, was pretty, pretty good. You know, that's like... 7000 Yeah, 7000 on the first day. And I went, okay, this is going to work. So that gave me the confidence and the, to go... Why would people buy from you and not ASN or the supplement den? What were you doing in retail? Did you have a wider range? Did you have lower prices? Did you have better service? Or were you serving people with your shirt off? <laughs> <laughs> They're all female customers coming in. Going, hi, Grant, can I get some protein? Um, it's a great question. I think um, we're in a better location. We're on a, a, a highway, basically, on a thoroughfare okay plenty of parking uh we had from from day one we had the big range but for me it was about customer service you know i wanted to try and separate myself from other uh, supplement stores and everyone that i went into and there wasn't many back then 
but they're all like, you know, I was fairly solid, but I can cover it up with a looser shirt. Um, but most of them are just eating chicken rice. <laughs> they're like, you know, in front of customers, I'm like... With their uh, massive water bottles. Yeah, like, and just no customer service, products over there, what do you want? <laughs> so <clears throat> I looked at other retailers and what they were doing to engage their customers and consumers, you know, done some research on customer service and I went, okay, Nutrition Warehouse is going to be a customer-centric model and really look after the customer and deliver wow, which one of our core values today still. Um, so when I come in, I would, to the point that other employees would say to me, how do you know that guy? Is that one of your mates? And I went, no, it's just a customer. Oh, I thought it was your mate. And I went, he is my mate. He's coming to our store, spending money with us and no one else. I treat everyone like a friend, you know what I mean? And not on purpose, because that is part of my personality type. I uh, enjoy being around people and talking to people and engaging with people and trying to help them with their goals and what they're trying to achieve themselves. So I think we took a few components which were really nothing new and just really pushed those into the supplement store game rather than the normal everyday bodybuilder mentality. Yeah, I experienced that actually. I was in one of your stores not long ago up near Harbour Town and they were fantastic. The one that's on Brisbane Road there. Oh, yeah, Labrador, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they were great, really good. What did you buy? Protein bars. Oh. I know you can't tell looking at me. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to know what you... I just... <laughs> <laughs> what year was that when you opened Underwood again? Uh, 2008. 2008. Right, great time to start a business. Right, <laughs> yeah. right in the financial... Yeah, did um, that affect you at all, the GFC? Well, it probably did, but obviously I will never know because I didn't have anything prior to right and bodybuilders just they need to keep eating protein it's it's pretty you just yeah. keep going so so what happened from there so you open underwood it starts yep. getting some traction how long was it before you got your second location i just want to get an idea yeah. of the velocity because a lot of times when you're sitting here and people are going to be listening to this podcast while they're on their way to work or they're sitting up late at night or whatever all over the world and it just seems so far away, $170 million in revenue, 550 staff, 100 and something stores. But what was it like in those early days? Like, because it's beautiful when you go, man, this guy was only at two stores after X amount of time. I can get there. Yeah. And then it just sort of, yeah. what was the compounding effect yeah. of that journey? Yeah, sure. So yeah, you won uh, Underwood, one store. Uh, then the store, once it was profitable, I went, or well, break even, profitable. Okay, let's do store two. And I had no choice anyway, because online was starting to, to boom a little bit. And that store, I had a little curtain in the Underwood store where I'd be packing web orders, you know, and in the initial first six months I was there by myself. So I'd be packing web orders, customers come in, I'd pop my head out the curtain <laughs> and then serve them, then go back in and pack more web orders. Uh, so it, we'd run out of space. So I opened in Green Slopes and I had Paul with me, my first employer at that time, and I Paul lived on the Gulf Coast too, so we used to commute. And I said to Paul, buddy, we're going to open in Green Slopes. He goes, that's further into Brisbane. I said, it's five minutes. However, it was only five minutes if you go at one o'clock in the afternoon. If you, if you, if you go at other certain times, it's like it adds another half hour wow. each way to the trip. Um, so the commute got further. But we've done that for another 12 months in Green Slopes. So two stores Yep. at the end of two years. Correct. And, on, and online. And online. Small, small online store? Or? It was starting to grow. I don't what? know the figures of online back then. Was it Shopify back then as well? No, or? it no. was something you, horrendous. Do you know Worst the rough, or something. rough percentage split of sales? No, no, I don't. I know that annually we're doing both stores and online. By then, probably, um, yeah, probably about 500K a year. So you're doing 500K a year after two years. Yep. A long way to 170 million, which is great. So what yep. happened after that second year? I just yep. want to step this through because yeah, I want awesome. people listening to go, this is actually how it's done. He did not franchise this business, guys. This is one dude from poking his head out behind the curtains and selling sups and running to the post office, built this. I mean, it's an amazing story. So keep, yeah. keep us so on that So we had Green Slope, same thing happened. We ran out of space. Online was too big. I also had a two-year ex exclusion from ASN, so I couldn't open next to a, any ASN 50Ks or for two years. So that two years was up. And I think, thank God, we can go back to the Gold Coast and open there. <laughs> next door to all the ASN. Yes, beside it. <laughs> <laughs> right beside. But the good thing about it was it was a blessing in disguise going to Brisbane first. 
because we, we started to own Brisbane for those two mm. stores and they were doing quite well um, as standalone stores. But we opened on Ashbourne on the Gold Coast. Now, I remember standing outside of this one, it's 300 squares, our biggest big box retail. This is where the, uh, the model really started to come to life because realistically, I'm sitting there going, wow, 300 square metres. You know, the rent was quite high. I'm like, okay, we'll put web out the bag, we back, we'll do a shop front at the front. Best decision ever made, that store outdone the other two stores in the first month. Wow. wow. And yeah. so to be clear, this um, cash flow to open these stores, that you're just taking the profits out of the first two stores, saving it to open a third store? Or did you take on bank debt, investors, anything, just internal finance? Internal finance, yeah. And, and were just, you paying yourself just enough to live? Or? Yeah, just yeah, small wage. Yeah. I've done that for a long time. A lot of people think, you know, we're doing this 16 years now. The first 10 years, it was like basic, basic place to live, basic car, just I, I, this, I love this. Yeah. I, love, I, love, I love this. That's why I want the, the mechanics. Like, so when you say basic wage, what are you paying? 50 or 70 grand a year or something like yeah, that? Yeah, 50, 60, 70. Yeah, back then it was just a little to, less. Just enough to live on. What do yeah. I need to live on? Get your supplements, get your wage. Yep, that was it. Yeah, for yeah. 10 years. Close to it, yeah. So I really hear that, guys, right? Like there is no, like I know with Eric, with MX Door, the boys, all the money's going back in, back in, back in, back in. You see a G-Wagon now, right? But that happened 15 plus years or 14 years into yep. the journey. It, it's so easy to start comparing yourself though. Like we're, we're three years into an e-commerce business and I'm sitting here asking myself, why aren't I doing $100 million, right? Like it, but you know, it's so easy to fall into that trap of comparison. And You're and comparing your Q1 to their Q3 or yep. whatever. Yep. That's yeah, that's why I always ask the question, what are you willing to go without? That, that, that is my key question to ask to anybody that's going into business, right? And you obviously went without for 10 years. How much time? Now people see the overnight success, you know? So, so Ashmore's open. You got this Ashmore store that's doing more than the other two stores. Um, the Gold Coast loves a good bodybuilding yeah, can shop, you mate. Yeah, talk us through the success of that <laughs> versus the other two? Why yeah, it was just an it... unbelievable moment. I remember setting up, I, I just had a baby girl, my daughter Ruby, who's now 15, wow. nearly 15. Um, so I was setting up store, store up. I've got photos there of my with Ruby sleeping in the pram while I'm setting up the shelving by myself. So still very hands-on, doing a lot myself, save cash flow. What can I do myself that I don't have to pay someone else to do? I uh, set up the store. People were coming in and I'm setting up. I'm like, my God, I'm not open, but hey, yeah, you can buy that buck, bucket of protein, you know, like selling as I'm setting up the store, uh, which was unbelievable. Um, that store was... Yeah, just mind blowing. We end up doing like three hundred thousand dollar months there wow. uh, in the first twelve months. Three hundred grand in a month. In a month. No, sorry. In hundred thousand dollar months. Three no, months. No, no. Three hundred thousand dollars a um, per month. No, a month. Sorry, sorry. What am I saying? Yes, a month. Yeah. Three hundred grand a month in a single thirty day period, Cl including online. That's wow. amazing. Just yeah. out of that store, also. Just out of that store. Just out of Ashmore. It, just out of Ashmore. Wow. It doesn't do that today, but it did back then. That's amazing. And now we've got six stores on the Gold Coast, so the, the, yeah. the love is spread out a little bit more. Yeah. That's where I used to go, definitely. Yeah. Like, I still, Ashmore. every once in a while, wasn't and, down And the model was a little bit different then. Like, obviously, with 100 and liver stores and stock control, we can't have the store like Ashmore used to look. You used to walk into Ashmore, and you would just go, OMG. Oh, mm. my God. It was just... So we thought, why have everything in the warehouse when we can have it in the shop front? Wow, okay. And you would walk in and there'd be hundreds of buckets. There'd be stacks, like JB Hi-Fi, stacks of pallets of pre-workouts and fat burners. And people would just go, wow. So it was a bit of a wow factor for Gold Coasters to come in. Anyone could attest to that. They ever went back in there back in the day. It was just blown away by the immense amount of stock, which would have helped sell more stock. People would have thought they were getting it wholesale, right? Stack like it high, watch it fly yeah. mentality. That was, yeah, sort of like the Walmart of bodybuilding. It's packed yeah. the roof or Costco of bodybuilding. And even so. today we talk about, oh, I wish we could still do that. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not as things easy. Things ex expire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you get to the end of, th is this three years in now? So this is three years in. We've got three stores. Wow. Uh, and then obviously making some good revenue and some good returns. So I invest that into hiring some really cool team members. Mm. I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? I know nothing about building a website, nothing about marketing, et cetera. So I was very fortunate that um, I hired a great e-com guy, uh, Robert, who was very hands-on in the early days. And 
after about three or four months, we needed something a bit more strategic. And Robert said, I've got a mate. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I've got a mate. Mm. This is going to go really well. So he brought a mate on called Tony. And uh, Tony's been part of the business nearly since day one. And Tony's a very hands-on, get shit done. How much, how much of the 100, uh, sorry, of the 170 million will e-com account for this year versus the stores? Um, yep, so about 25%. 25%. The rest is through yep. your storefronts and online. That's yep. great. So that builds a really defensible motor around your business, right? Yep. Like e online's one thing, but to actually have a footprint of 100 and whatever stores, that's a, that's serious distribution that's not easy to, to replicate. Yeah. With absolutely. that culture embedded, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. So you got the three stores. What happened next? Talk us through the next, was it, you know, like, let's say the next five years from those three stores, you would have some confidence building now. Yeah, what, well, what we're, yeah, I guess, yeah, we're, we're starting to kill it and obviously feel a bit more confident and uh, in the model and like, right, okay, this works. What now? You know, how do we scale? Do we scale? Do we franchise? Do we keep it privately owned? So we went through those protocols and obviously we landed on now let's keep it privately owned which I think was our best decision one of a great decision that we made many years ago um, and then yeah we're like well where, where can we open next and like back then there was a bit of a race on too you know you had ASN still going you had Mass Nutrition who had more stores than us they were up like 10 or 15 by then they were actually leading um, a little bit different model than um, we were not around today but they might be around, but they're very small. Might have mm. two or three stores, but they had they went up to fifty or sixty stores at one stage. Wow! Um, and then tumbled. So we were like, well, what, what do we want to do? Well, let's get as many stores on the ground as we can, and that was our strategy really for for a number of years. Let's let's scale as fast as we can with the cash flow and open stores in key areas how did you do that so did you recruit somebody who was head of store opening or how what, what's the actual how look, does it happen we probably should have looking back <laughs> like you look back now and think why didn't we hire like we didn't have anyone of head of marketing for eight nine years right we've done it ourselves so you just literally put the like were you like at in between everything else you were doing, were you like going on to real commercial and had alerts set up for new spaces or? Yes, how exactly you, that. Is, is that what you did? Yeah, initially it was me, Tony, finding the stores. We would just look at areas, put alerts up, call real estate. You know, we, we were doing the project management work realistically. We still today fly to locations and look at them because we want to touch and feel them before we say yes. You got to have your boots on the ground and feel what's around you and the traffic flow and all that, I guess. 200%, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was really like, okay, we're going to open up five stores this year. Where are we going to open? And initially, we, we just we, we covered Queensland first. So our strategy was, let's open stores, but let's not spread across Australia because uh, the cost to service those is higher than if we have 10 stores on, in the Gold Coast or in Queensland. So we thought, okay, let's own Queensland first. So we went after, you know, Lutwich and then different stores through Brisbane, uh, Brisbane City, et cetera, and then Sunshine Coast. And, you know, we get up to 10 to 15 stores quite quickly in the next two years. And at what point did you get a centralised distribution centre warehouse? Well, we added, added, added the back of Ashmore for the first... We stayed there for about three or four years. And we're still at... Uh, now we're at uh, Coomera. Upper Coomera, and we've been there for 10 years now. That's your fulfillment centre. That's though, a there. fulfillment centre. So ju is there a retail store attached? No. No, it's just a fulfillment. So all your stuff comes there, yep. and then you distribute it out to the stores? Not all of it, our private label brands. Okay, so yeah, I was going to ask you about that. down. Yep. About, so you, you do own some of the brands yourself? Correct. So that, that there's more margin in that? Correct. So we'll get into the margin in that, and I know Eric is itching to get into that. But so let's just sort of high level um now just sort of fast forward the journey a little yep. bit so if you were to sort of describe it in broad terms the phases of the business like the first three years you had three stores and then was it just gradual like 5 10 15 20 or was it like a period where you just went like up and up yeah what were the i should have brought a pie chart with me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just, it's just so, fascinating yeah. for people. what yeah, were the yeah, hurdles yes. in between like from that level to that level. Yeah, so I guess um, we got really lucky in a few ways, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that for you guys, is that, yes, we had good advice um, 
open in Queensland first. Don't, otherwise you're travelling around spending resources. Okay, we don't, and we own Queensland. And then we were like, okay, where's next? You know, once we had about 10 stores in Queensland, let's go to New South Wales. That's the next logical. How did we do it? Do we go down there and do we hire someone new that don't understand the brand, the culture, the model? Or let's take one of our top guys from him, give him a carrot and go down and he, he can start nutrition warehouse in, in um, New South Wales. Yep. And that's what we did. And uh, we've done that. We've replicated that model many, in every state in Perth, in uh, Victoria. So when you say carrot, you get a guy who's going to be the GM of New South Wales kind of thing. And, and did you cut him in for equity, uh, pay him a big salary? What, what do you do when you want to go, I'm going to open an entire new state that I'm not going to see a lot. How do you empower somebody to, to, to build that under you in a, in a way that works for them and for you? Yeah, so we, yeah, we looked at different options, what we could do. Equity was on the table, but uh, then at the last, not the last moment, but we probably thought, we don't want to give away equity unless we really need to. So, yeah, let's give them a great package that, you know. And these guys, I'm talking like 23, 25 years old, ah. that really want to, you know, go down, create something for themselves and get paid well for it. Uh, so a so, cut of overall sales or something? Correct, yes. Yeah. Yes. So it was uh, a, a great package and the better that that state did, the better they did. Mm. Mm. So it was just just pure financial incentivization. Go down there, crush it, correct. and maybe make a few hundred grand a year when they're absolutely if they, yeah. if they smash it. Yep. And so were their responsibilities finding the stores, building the culture, doing everything you were doing, or were you still managing the store finding and stuff? Probably everything, except we were still finding the store findings. Right. That would definitely help with lo local knowledge. Or go look at the stores, help us, give us advice, anything like that. Would always obviously have monthly catch ups. What's going on? Uh, but yeah, their job was to build that culture, build that culture, understand the model. Hire. Hire, that. fire, et cetera. Yeah. Are, are those people still with you? Some are. Some have recently left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most of those guys were around for around 10 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. They've done that. So some, are still, some are still with us. So you find a straight killer to go in and say, he's our guy for New South Wales. And you yeah. find somebody internally, send them down to Melbourne uh, usually, and then... Uh, who's already been in the culture and the business. Correct, yes. Yeah. And one of the things we found really strange was like, why isn't nobody else doing this? Like, we done, we done Queensland, we done New South Wales, and then we're like, okay, Victoria's next. Now, you would think someone would have like looked at and replicated our model and tried to do this, but when we got to Victoria, there was no player down there that was actually had multiple storefronts. So... Yeah, Jeff they sort of made it easier for us. Jeff Bezos said he can't believe the head start that everyone let him have. That probably sounds a bit the same with you. To, it comes down to vision, right? Like I always say to people that in business, you've got to have first the vision, then you've got to have your standards, then you've got to recruit to the vision and the standards. Most people's vision is just not what yours was. And that that is where you won from the sound of it. You're like, yeah. I want to dominate the entire country. Whereas a lot of people set out in life, and I just want to have a supplement store and get wholesale supplements yeah. you know? and look it didn't start out like that i didn't sit there at store one and go i'm going to dominate the, the country i think the vision changed okay you know over the years and after we got to a little bit of scale it was like okay let's dominate australia did you, you know? continue reading after the uh, rich dad poor dad or did you all the time so once Still you got did. into that you kept personally developing and growing yeah seminars stuff like that Anything, anything, anything that I can do that I have time to do. Yep, seminars, Tony Robbins, Tom Bilyeu, uh, Gary V. Yeah. I don't. I'm not a mute. People go, "What do you listen to music?" I'm like, oh, "I don't know what music you like." I said, oh, "I don't actually know." Or music. Yeah. What do you listen to? I said, "I actually don't." If I'm in the car, I'm listening to your podcast. Yeah. Mm. Or you know anything else that I can learn from, because I put myself in uh, in in, uh, in a learner's chair. I continually just want to keep learning and growing and developing myself so I can help others if, if possible. How many hours at that time? So 2011, three stores and, you, and you're ramping up. So say by 2015, how many stores roughly would you have had by 2015? 2015. Roughly. Um, how many years is that in? That's uh, eight years, probably about 30. About 30 stores. So at, at that point in time, how much are you working? How many hours a week are you working? More than I am now. <laughs> I know. I'm going to get to that question. That's interesting, um, though, right? So the yeah. business is more is three times bigger, and you're working less now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 30 stories. You're growing this thing. Are you working 40 hours a week? 60 hours a week? Probably 60 hours. 60 hours. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, still in the thick of it. You're in the thick of it, yeah. Still, yeah. And how many years were you in the thick of it? Where you were in that 60 hours building mode? How many years, con consecutive years? It's probably the first 10 to 11 years. 10 to 11 years, yeah. from 2008. Correct. Yes. yes. So about 2018, 2019, yeah. and that kind of adds up because you said you were taking, you know, 50, 60, 70 grand for about 10 years as well. Yeah. So I that 60 same. hours a week, putting in, uh, uh, sorry, 60 grand a year, say, at, you know, 60 yeah. hours a week. Yeah, well, we didn't even take dividends until the last few years. Like. Wow. I say that's so common. It really does take a decade in most cases to build a big business. Yes. You know, to, to get the... the the pipes and the roots into the ground for a biz, big business. It doesn't happen in one, two, three, even five. It really takes a decade of the same thing for the big businesses. Yeah, for me, it was about putting that cash flow back into the business to keep growing. Like, if we're going to open 10 stores in a year, that takes a substantial amount of cash flow mm. when you're not borrowing from the banks. So it's like, how do we do that? Cash is the lifeblood of business. So, so when did you bring in your own private label products? Because initially you're just buying products from other manufacturers. When did you bring in your own? And are you manufacturing this white label? You have a manufacturing company, I imagine, that makes it under your brand and your margins are much better. Is that sort of the... Yeah, so um, we've got four brands within Nutrition Warehouse mm -hmm. uh, that, are that we own and operate. Uh, and the first one, Genetics Nutrition, was there day one when I opened when I founded Nutrition Warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, so first day, because that that was the model that I set upon. We need our own brands within the supplement game to be able to for for, for a multitude of reasons. Obviously, margin control over the product, so we know what's in it, so we can obviously give good quality. But also, if customers love that brand, they have to come back to us. Mm being probably the, the highest level now. Um, and we, re, we brought on new brands as we've grown to fill different markets and different areas and different consumers. Now, did you create all those brands or did you buy any of the brands? No, I created all of them from right scratch. From scratch. Yep. What percentage of sales would be your white label brands versus other brands? 45%. Oh, oh, wow. 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 That's part of the model too. And increasing, obviously. Sorry? And increasing, obviously. No, we don't, we don't try to increase it. We try to keep it at that level. Okay. Because we obviously want to do what's best for the consumer, what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's still 50% plus of what they, can, they, they, they might want to choose. Um, and obviously we have brand partners that we really rely on and respect and have a great relationships and they need to sell their products too. That goes back to discipline again, eh? Like you would think, no, I just want to keep going with my own brand, but you'd almost cannibalize your own business doing that, wouldn't you? It's possible, yeah. Mm. Like when I lived in the US, I'd see those super, super stores you're talking about, GNC Nutrition, and they had their own brands, but Correct. they had everything else as well. Because all those brands are advertising in the mm. industry. When you open a bodybuilding magazine, uh, you know, why wouldn't you? There are going to be consumers that resonate with a particular brand, especially in some of the niches or whoever's sponsoring it. So makes perfect sense to, to, to i don't know if, if you know the numbers on this but today what what percentage of um the products that you sell the supplements are, are hardcore bodybuilding supplements versus more longevity and wellness supplements how's how's that shifted over the years yeah our top three categories is protein powders pre-workouts and fat burners right they're the top three yeah. mm -hmm. so and that would probably make up 50 percent, 60 percent of the business okay I, i've done a few quick calculations here just going back so by 2010 you've got two stores online you're growing and you're doing five hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue between two stores and your online business roughly yep and now you're doing 170 million dollars a year which is 464 thousand a day yep it's about right. right so you fast forward 14 years and you're doing what you were doing in a year in it, basically in, day. in one day <laughs> which for all the for all the listeners out there is about twenty thousand dollars an hour <laughs> in sales every hour it should be more <laughs> like like I like those that. numbers those numbers are unbelievable yeah, it's incredible and it just shows you the power of a uh, a good idea and a replicable system what what are the plans for nutrition warehouse going forward um now like you own pretty much you, you're the biggest by far in australia right today uh, is the plans to go overseas um 
you know, what's the Yeah, plan? so I guess, yeah, when we look at the business and we look at strategy, we're like, well, you know, if the old adage, if you're not growing, you're dying. Mm. So we want to keep growing and how do we do that? You know, we're great at opening retail stores and, and making those work and obviously e-com. Uh, so we decided that New Zealand is the next logical step for us. Let's yeah. uh, jump the waters and, and let's make New Zealand work. Let's go... Uh, help New Zealand just get fit and healthy. So That, that um, should take you at least three months. That <laughs> should. <laughs> 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 but I mean, you know, like New Zealand is quite small, but, you know, yes. it's, it's three and a half million people. So yes. is the plans beyond New Zealand or you're not sure? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, if you asked me five years ago, would you go overseas or open a national? Again, no. Mm. Australia's it. That's all we're doing. However, again, things change and things evolve and... As I said, we're going to New Zealand. Let's see how that goes and how we do there and how we fare working internationally because there's obviously, uh, you know, some things we don't... would punch us in the face and we'll be like, oh, man, we didn't think about that. Um, you know, it's funny, like uh, a lot of, you know, my head of marketing's like, where's our big plan for New Zealand? And I'm like, we just go there. Let's just open. Come on, yes, you know, like yeah, yeah. that's the way I am. I'm not going to work out a big plan. I said, we'll be right. So it's how we always do it. You know, yeah. um, but look, would we go to other international countries? It's possible, mm. you know, or will it be me doing it? That's possible, not, po you know, maybe it's someone else doing it after I leave, you know. But so there's no plan to sell the business at the moment, you're just going to, or list it or do anything? No, a lot of people ask me, you're going to sell or list it? And I'm like, I don't think I'd list it. Sell, look, everything's for sale. However, right now, it'd be... I don't think I'm ready to sell. Do, like, I, I do get approached, you know, two, three times a year. They want to sit down and have a coffee and, private you know, equity, private right. equity. And I'm like, ah, no, because I put myself in the position of, like, if I, if I sold and I had a pile of cash next to me, what would I do? Mm. That, what, would I, what would I do for the next 12 months? Because what, what are your margins in your business, like, now? Um, about 45%. I mean, wow. net, net GP. margin. GP. 45% GP. Uh, GP's 45, yeah. GP's 45. Yeah, net's below 10. Yeah. Yeah. That's still an amazing business yeah. on, a, on 170 million. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing, right? Like when you've got a business at that scale, even at 10% or slightly below, yeah. I mean, there's not a lot you, you, you can't do with that sort of money that you could do with half a billion in the bank, right? Like it's... Yeah, it's enough to, you know... Unless you want a private be, plane or something. <laughs> be joyous on, but for me, it's like... Right now, it feels like still unfinished business. Mm. Do, you, do you focus on the valuation, on building the, the, the valuation of the business? Not really, no. It's not, it's not something I really focus on. Like, I haven't gone to someone and said, how do I make this worth more money so I can sell it? Because my driver isn't money. It never has been. It sounds funny because, you know, we're building this big business. But for me, it's about, you know, bodybuilding is about achieving something and going, wow, I didn't believe I could do that. I'd done it, you know. Now it's like building this business, a bit like bodybuilding. Well, how big can I get? Or how good can we get? Mm. And I guess I really want Nutrition Warehouse to be around for decades. You know, when I'm, even when I'm gone, you know, it'd be amazing for my kids to drive past and go, oh, my dad started that. Mm. I like, think Probably I, why they're in their Porsche or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a really interesting thing for the listeners just to really not skip this moment mm -hmm. because... I hear the same language when I talk to Eric and your partners at MX, the boys that actually built it. it. They said exactly those words. It was never about the money. It still isn't about the money. It was never built to be sold. And they're like still like if you talk to Jake or, the, or, or, or Dan and the guys, yep. they're very much like, no, no, it's unfinished business. It's still got more to do. When I spoke to the, one of the founders of High Smile who absolutely crushing it, I asked them, a few years ago you're like what, what's the plan like it's got to be worth a fortune Colgate or somebody's going to buy this from you and he's like yeah look we know that but it's unfinished business there's so much more market we want to build at that time they hadn't launched toothpaste they were just doing the tooth whitening back then now they're in tooth, toothpaste and they're in all the coals or woolies around the country there's so much more opportunity and I think when you're listening here it's these people who are never satisfied that are constantly there to just be the best rather than change, like buying a Bentley or <laughs> that shit just runs out pretty quick yes. if you've got a half decent business. Um, it's got to be something more. There's got to be a why. And in your case, it sounds like it's the pursuit of how far can we take this 
And unlike bodybuilding, well, bodybuilding's got an end point, right? You win and that's sort of it. Yes. And then it's sort of like a downhill slope because there's always some other young bloke coming up who's bigger and better genetics and whatever. But in business, you can sort of keep going and expanding. And I guess that's just a thing that's embedded in guys like you. Yeah. And another part of it is it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm really attached to it. I really do love it. I mean, I love still growing the business, working with the team. You know, there's nothing better than sounds weird i still love skipping to work on a monday morning and going right what's on this week we yeah. got you know ehp labs week on this weekend we're opening a new store in warner's bay this weekend we're going to the expo in uh, the fitness center in april like these things get me excited still and still keep and me in the industry that i did love which was you know health and fitness bodybuilding and you get your needs met too i imagine when you turn up at a show or somebody you're very well known now in the space and there's significance that comes with that and a sense of fulfillment when you're meeting the customers going can i get do you, I, people get selfies with you and stuff like that as well so i would sure. imagine yeah. <laughs> <Do that? laughs> no, it is. yeah yeah they do yeah look um no this that does feel great obviously and very honored that people think that way and for me it's you know we just opened sydney city store um in town hall um recently but, you know, I was on the mic and talking to the customers and, you know, interviewing them style, like, what, what do you shop at Nutrition Warehouse for? I do love interacting with our consumers. And that's the bit you can't buy, right? You can't buy that. You can't buy that. And if I sell, that's all what gone. What are you going to do? It's all gone. Exactly. So my wife wants me to sell. <laughs> Spend some more time <laughs> in Europe. She wants to go live in Italy for, like, the rest of our lives. I'm like, <laughs> before I'm too old, I'm like... But you could probably do that for six months if you really wanted to and come correct, back yeah. and... I mean, that's the bit that people don't talk about or connect with a lot is what it's like when the business matures. And there is that sense of significance and um, but not from an ego point of view, but just a contribution point of view. Like we get such a kick out of mm. like Eric spoke on the weekend and at an event and I spoke there too. But just connecting with the people who listen to the pod who come up and get a, a selfie and give you feedback about, hey, we love the pod and that thing yeah. you said. And that gives us a real buzz far more than a dividend. Like yeah. it, you can't put a price on that. Yeah. That feeling. Yeah. The nutrition warehouse wasn't founded for money. It was founded mm. to, to help people achieve their goals, the health and fitness goals. And for me, you know, giving up bodybuilding was hard too because you know I, that was my identity. You know, Grant Mass Mayo. You know what I mean? Like you know, but to then to get away from bodybuilding and try and look after my health and fitness better, and then get into business. Like to let that go when I thought, like if you talk to my mum, she'll go, I would have never believe Grant could have be where he is today. And I, I'm with her. I don't, didn't believe Grant would be where he is today. So to give that up too soon, and I know 16 years is still a long time and in the scheme of things, it still feels like too soon to, to walk away. What's a day in the life of Grant Mayo today? How much are you working? What are you doing? Yeah, Take sure. Us through that. Yeah, um, you know, I still go up in the morning, get myself ready for work, the kids, drop them off at school. Yeah, I'm getting work around you know, just after nine o'clock um, with a coffee in hand and uh, meetings, obviously, with the team, strategy. It's more high level these days, obviously. I'm not working in the stores, working at support office and supporting our team and our stores and what they need. What's the future like for Nutrition Warehouse? Where are we heading? You know, and then executing those different projects you know and there's lots of different projects you know when you get to 111 stores and scale of australia and pop on over to new zealand there's so much involved in any business of that scale that sometimes you're like oh your head gets blown away but i've got a great team like the team is relentlessly great um a lot have been there for a lot of years so they understand the business and what we're trying to do and i enjoy being there with them i got i got a quick a question here there's two areas of the business that um, when they scale, I, I, I would imagine are quite challenging. And I'd love to just talk about the granular things that you do in these two areas today or along the way there. One is how do you keep the culture, like practically, like what do you actually do? Do you have all hands meetings? Do you have onboarding processes? What do you do to maintain that amazing wow culture like um, built for life like how do you actually embed that mm -hmm. practically what are the things you do and on the sales side what do you do to drive like on the ground you've got a store manager i imagine in each store who's got a report and is accountable to kpis what what do you do to keep 
them driven, recognize them for performance. So how do you drive culture and how yep. do you drive performance yeah, in sure. business? Yeah, I guess culture is probably one of the most important things, obviously, in, in any business. And there's been times we've been great at that and not so great at that. And the last few years, we've definitely worked on it. You know, we launched, relaunched, and we looked at our business and went, you know, our values and our mission is probably, uh, we, which we did when we first opened. So we reevaluated it and re-looked at it and we worked with the entire team to work through the values rather than just me saying, these are our values. Um, so yeah, we redid those, you know, and um, you know, our value system aligns with the wider business, you know, deliver well, enjoy the journey. You know, we don't want people to come to work and not enjoy themselves. Um, so you collaboratively had the staff input towards the values? Correct, And yes. then you commute, like you're talking 550 people here. So how do you communicate? Do you have Zoom calls? Like I really want to get into that tactical, yeah. like how do you communicate with 550 people today yeah. that work for so you? So we make sure those values are instrumental in conversations, you know, from myself, from, uh, from our leaders, from our store managers, all the way down when they're talking with each other, those values are, you know, brought up. And then we have awards as well for those values each quarter so you can nominate someone in your team which aligns with that award like how they delivered well um, but we also do shirts and apparel for the which had those values on it we, um, we also do you know ha have expos a couple of times a year where we bring teams together we have conference you know uh, we had our first conference last year which was amazing just for your staff just for the staff so it's like an off-site off-site yep okay uh, and that was great for morale and obviously to, to help build culture. We do events, sporting events together, like um, True Grit, 5K run, which I do all the time. It kills me. I'm like, oh, my God, i got to start training for these. But I like to show up and turn up and do it with the team. It's a really great experience. All that helps build culture, you know what I mean, and helps the team understand what we're trying to achieve for our consumers as do well. Do you do all hands meetings, like Zoom calls with everybody? Not ev not all hands, not no. everybody, no. Just like at the state level and stuff? Correct, yes. And what about sales performance? How do you drive sales in the stores? Like how do you incentivize and yeah, get, so, get the outcomes? Yep, so in store we have a, obviously a, a base salary and then we have an incentive scheme. We've yeah. had that for a long time, nearly the whole length of the business. So and do they genuinely strive for those incentives? Yes, they do. Absolutely. They're good incentives. And do you recognise them? Like, do, like I used to work in Godfrey's, right? And okay. every Monday morning, there was a fax that went out to all the Godfrey stores in Queensland, and it had ranked from top to bottom the top performing salespeople. We used to work our asses off to be like get on that list. Get on yes. that list. Uh, fax machine giving away my age a little bit here, but that was such a simple but powerful thing. Do you do something like that? Or yeah, anything, yeah. So anything like a, that that people could take away. We have the internet, you know, like we call it the scoop, yep. scoop protein. Uh, and then everything's listed on there. Or right. everything from the awards to, to, to ratings. So. Is it every week that it's published or how? I think it's monthly. Monthly. Yeah. So people strive to dominate. Yes. You don't want to be on the bottom of that list. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> now that's good. Like yeah. that kind of practical stuff, like people don't realise, but people will do a lot more for recognition than they will for money, I've found. Mm -hmm. With the awards at Reliable, our old education business, the stuff people used to do to win those awards, they would fly halfway around the world to get on stage to be recognised because as adults we don't get yeah. recognised. And we have a award ceremony um, we used to do at the Christmas party but now we do it at the uh, conference where everyone's recognised for you know from anything from best area manager to best manager best store best area best sales people sales mastery. And that works like people like work hard to win those stuff. They love yeah. I love giving those awards out to people too because they've worked really hard to get those awards. I reckon any company that's not doing that that's a big miss. So some, the sales mastery is actually you have not missed one KPI in nearly in the 12 months. I think you can miss one in 12 months. Mm -hmm. So it hit every K, K, KPI for a salesperson for 12 months straight nearly. That is sensational. That's a lot of our store, store managers, all staff. Yeah, that's that vision, standards recruitment. You know, here's the standards that we're going for. They're articulated, they're distributed, they're understood. And then you go out and get people to do it. It's great. Yeah. And it's a unique business, right? Like I'm assuming it's like MX. <clears throat> a lot of the people that work at MX are in MX. They froth MX. They love it. I'm assuming it'll be very similar to Nutrition Warehouse. Most of the people that work in Nutrition Warehouse are working out. They're bodybuilders. They're, is, is that right? Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're into health and fitness. They're yeah. supplement junkies. Yeah. They love the products. They get really frothy over new product launches, new flavors. 
yeah, there's something exciting about sports supplements, you know, yeah. that really makes That's you want to try and go train and, or get active, you know. So, yeah. yes, 100%. What's some, a uh, couple pieces of advice that you would give Grant 10 years ago? Because there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are in that exact same stage. And I see you're reading off the paper. So I am, I am. You've got a you couple. Know, like, I thought, I don't do that many podcasts. I thought, I'm going to get there and go, oh, you're <laughs> blank. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so again, you know, you I, did watch, six... I did. I was smart enough to watch the YouTube and see you guys had notes. I went, I'm going to take notes. Yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're working 60 hours a week. 10 years ago, you know, you got 15 stores. 10 years later, you got 111. Talk to Grant Mayo 10 years ago. What's yeah, I... What I, would have, what I would have, it's the question, what I would have done, changed? Yeah, yeah well, I probably would have um, done things a little bit different, you know. I probably would have got ahead of marketing, yeah, ahead of projects, and really probably had better strategy meetings, you know. Really sit down each month and go, you know, definitely yearly and go, this is what we're trying to achieve this year. Who's responsible? When's it responsible by? And have people in charge of each of those Back then, it was so like, we'll do it all ourselves, you know. We'll take a lot on ourselves and do it to the work rather than delegating to other people to do and then aspiring and helping those guys and motivating and helping where you can and then focusing on bigger things like opening more stores or culture or something like that. We really were... We probably held the ball too close all those years ago and I would have said, stop that. Go to get these key people in the business. Fire yourself more often. Fire myself more often, yeah. And, and we've sort of done a lot ourselves, which taught us each part of the business, which was really good. So when people go, oh, you know, I can go, well, I've done that too. So what, what are you struggling with? So I've almost been at every part of the business from, you know, salesperson to area manager to marketing to packing web orders. So there's no, no job I haven't done. Initially, that's what you have to do. You know, it's a bit, you know, like a... You know, starting a business is like a jumbo jet, isn't it? I like to say, it's like you're taking off from the ground and, you know, you're, everyone's on board, they're sitting down, like you're taking off and once you're in the air, it's smooth sailing and you can sort of relax and put on autopilot. For, for the people out there that want to start a business or a $100 million business, um, uh, physical exercise and competition has been an important part of your journey. How important would you say being physically active is while trying to run a business? Well, I think it's different for everyone. For me, it's very important. And not just to run a business, it's just who I am. Obviously, bodybuilding um, set me on a path of health and fitness and well-being. And I have to train. Like, I still flex in the mirror at home. My wife's <laughs> like, when will you stop flexing in the mirror? And I went, probably when I'm dead. It's just something that you do. You know, I want to look after myself. And not egotistically, but now for my kids and my family and to be around. I want to be around when I'm 80. Mm. You know, once my kids grow up, I don't want to be in, a, in the grave too early. So I think it's very important, health and fitness, you know, looking after yourself, you know, eating the right foods, taking the right supplements, um, you know, doing what you can to hack your body, basically, mm. to, to stay as young as you can whilst you age because age is inevitable for all of us. We're all going to go there. Um, but there's other people out there that don't train, you know, that are doing really well as well. You know what I mean? And mm. so it works for them. It works for them. So I think it's individualized and personal. But I think it's definitely a bonus. Like I think anyone that trains and looks after themselves has a diff different mindset or discipline mm. than someone that just works without training at all. Yeah, sport definitely teaches the the discipline, the competitive nature. There's there's a lot of uh, crossover skill sets for sure agreed we, we've known each other for a long time and one thing i've always loved about you grant is how humble you are mm -hmm. right like very like adam said earlier very unassuming how do you stay so humble and grounded when you know know you've got one of the probably biggest businesses in australia especially from a from a retail e-com space it's a good question i think i'll give an example i i won the mr world in 1997 um, to my delight and I got home oh sorry I got back to the apartment in the hotel in Greece and I had a shower and I washed off all that fake tan <laughs> and I looked in the mirror and I went how the fuck did I win that because I still see glaring weaknesses in my body as a bodybuilder 
you're never good enough. It's no, there's, a, there's no end game because you can never be good enough because you're always got that body dysmorphia of like, ah, oh, my calves could have been bigger. My, you know, my lats could have been bigger. I could have been leaner. So I was like, I was honestly disappointed in myself. Oh no, I won. Now that's probably some psychological damage I've had over the years or something, but, or maybe it's just part of the trait that I am, that I just want to be better and better. Yeah. Um, so I think just being humble is just part of who I am too. Like I didn't expect to win Mr. World. I didn't expect to own a business. And I think just because I won Mr. World, I own a business doesn't mean I'm end up better than anyone else. Like I've got friends that have nothing and, probably happier than I am, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's all, what is your, what makes you happy? What makes you successful? Because success is different to everybody. You know, do I see myself as successful? Not really, you know what I mean? I just went after something and that it worked out well, you know, but it wasn't just me, it was a whole group of people, 550 to be exact, that helped me get there, you know? So I think humble is just, part of my personality type. I yeah. think they used to call me Mr. Wonderful when I was bodybuilding. And that come from, I would turn up a comp happy and like, yeah, yeah we're competing today. Where everybody was like, oh, <laughs> you know, let's get this out the way. I'm, I haven't eaten, you know, I'm like, yeah, but you knew you were getting into when you started. What, what did you do it for? If you're not enjoying the journey, then why do it? H have you bought anything now with your success that like is a bit of a, thing for yourself have you spoiled yourself at all if so what has been something you spoiled yourself with uh, the only thing of six years ago I brought a Tesla that's it <laughs> it's probably about it I don't own a boat no jet skis got a house obviously nice house um, yeah. and obviously I'll probably divert some of that um, money back into properties and, and so forth so you do invest a little bit outside I do invest, the business yeah now. and other businesses as well real estate and other businesses yep. yeah so I've used that to I guess invest more but my toys are probably, we go on a great family holiday once a year to Italy for yeah. about a month. Yeah. Nice. Good for you. Great way to spend money on experiences. That's the stuff. There's a great book called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins. I don't know if you've read it. No. But it's, it's on the art of actually spending money. It says most people like you and Eric and us, you know, we spend decades of our life in the accumulation of uh, not not... Well, wealth, I guess, the pursuit of, <coughs> of success in business and growing our financial life. But we, we really often don't know how to actually spend money at the end of it and why and how to spend it wisely, not in an investment term, but for life optimization. It's a terrific read. You'll probably really enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, I think that, that probably comes from my mum, I guess. We yeah. grew up in a very, you know, normal, everyday family. <coughs> um, and mum even today, you know, God love her she won't pay five dollars for a cup of coffee <laughs> good honor that's, that's where I, that's where i get it from like i still feel bad spending money on myself do you feel bad spending money on yourself yes a little Same. bit yeah i know yeah, yeah definitely. it's ridiculous yeah i don't like to, i don't like to waste it my, my mom was my mom taught me a lot and she said there's wants and needs mm. you know do you want it or you need it mm. if you want it think about it for a couple of days if you still want it go get it mm. but if you need it like a washing machine then go buy it you know yeah. what i mean and uh, that sort of stuck with me. Yeah, no, it's good. I love that. I love that about Aussie. I know we've got a massive audience in the UK for, for the pod. Like the, the UK audience is the most loyal, uh, lo not most loyal, but the, the longest watches of our pod. And I think that the Brits really resonate with this kind of vibe. Like, because most pods are the Americans and it's like, you know, we got multiple Rolls Royces and private jets that we lease and all this shit. And yes. Aussies is like, nah, fuck that. Let's, let's actually build a good business and, you know, like... Your big flex might be a Malu Ute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, a or a Tesla. Or a, <laughs> or a Tesla, you know. So I, I love that about our pod and the people that come on here. So Grant, we're pretty much out of time here. It's been a, a fantastic great session, story. I think. Yeah, it is. It's a great story. And, and I think for all of you listening, no matter where you are, uh, please remember, we're sitting with a guy here that's 55 years old, has been at this since 2008. For some of you, that would seem like forever ago uh, or when you were just kids this is a man that focused on performance and focused on excellence and had a real drive so if you're sitting there go so-and-so's done this to me well you've just got a massive present my friend <laughs> you know that revenge that drive that chip on your shoulder is very very common on highly successful people like grant uh for in highly successful people like grant um 
And I hope that you are listening to this and going, I will start where I am. This is a guy from Newcastle, Australia, a working class town uh, who built it all from scratch. You heard it here today. Listen to this podcast twice if you have to. Give yourself time. Don't compare your Q1 to Grant's Q3 and uh, keep going. This is a great example of the Aussie kangaroo here in the corner. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Cheers. And for everybody here at home, remember, drop a comment below. Let us know what you thought of this pod. Do we want more people on like Grant, more stories like this? Um, And a big thank you to our sponsor, Early Bird AI. Go and talk to those guys. Thanks for being here, guys. We'll see you soon on the next episode of Unemployable. Bye for now. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.